Hello, I'm Kevin Cameron, and my subject for the moment, it's always changing, is pistons. This is recognizably a piston. It has piston rings to seal the bore. The upper two rings are gas rings, which seal the combustion gas. This is an oil scraper ring that prevents oil from the lower end of the engine from being swept into the combustion chamber, where the result would be smoke and a citation from the uh, Central Emissions Bureau. Central Emissions Agency, sorry, sorry. This has its connecting rod still attached. This is called a slipper piston because instead of being completely cylindrical, it has just two skirts and is relieved on the sides. This makes the piston lighter and it also avoids the friction of having this part rubbing against the cylinder bore. A recognizable piston. This is also a piston. It's a little shorter. It's also relieved at the sides. It's obviously a two valve because it has two big cutouts, two gas rings, oil scraper rings, monstrous wrist pin. Recognizably though, it's a piston. If these two are pistons, then what's this? This is what pistons are becoming. This is a piston from a Honda CRF 450F motocrosser. And when you set this piston down, instead of sitting on its skirt like a proper piston, the first thing that touches is the wrist pin bosses. The wrist pin goes through here. It rocks back and forth. It has these little mini skirts, barely enough to stabilize the piston in the bore. Why is it necessary for pistons to atrophy away to almost nothing? All we have here is a thin disc that's enough to locate the piston rings, two bosses for the wrist pin that connects the piston to the connecting rod, and little skirts. Why does it have to become almost not there? The reason is that the up and down motion of the piston produces a shaking force. You cannot balance all of the shaking force of an engine by adding counterweights to the crankshaft. You can reduce the vibration, you can't make it go away. Also, in a very high RPM engine, moving up and down as it does, the piston produces very large bearing loads. Those bearing loads translate into friction, which is subtracted from the horsepower that your engine can send to the rear wheel. So therefore, we're going to make the pistons as light as we possibly can. We're going to get rid of everything that wasn't necessary in these monsters. But this is quite a large piston. When I feel the thickness, the center of the dome is quite thin. What's going to happen to the heat of combustion that is being collected by this whole surface. Normally, in traditional pistons, that heat is conducted out to the cylinder wall, which is cooler. In the case of this 450 motocross engine, it's a water-cooled engine, so the cylinder wall can be quite cool. But this is a big distance for heat to flow. And they want to make the dome thin Normally, if we were going to conduct all that heat away from the center of the dome to the cylinder wall, we'd make it quite thick, a broad avenue for heat. But this is thin. So what they have done is they have placed a small oil jet down in the crankcase, which sprays oil up underneath the piston, hits at one side, splashes across under the dome, is deflected down the other skirt and falls back into the crankcase. That oil cools the piston dome, allowing it to be made thinner. Clever, these humans.